and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Vicki Stroich, and I'm president of Literary Managers and Dramaturgs of the Year. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this keynote event, Speaking of Change, at LNDA's 28th Annual Conference. Now, this year, we've invited uh, the members of the general public to join us, uh, to join our delegates here at the keynote event. So, we want to welcome everyone who doesn't currently have a lanyard on. And let you know the lanyard people are very kind. <laughs> and uh, they're happy to talk to you about dramaturgy. All you need to do is ask. Um, we also want to welcome everyone watching at home. We are live streaming this as part of HowlRound. So, we wish you all could be with us, but we're glad you're watching at home. I hope you're having a great party watching the keynote. Um, LMDA, of course, of course, hosts many great regional events and an annual conference in different spots around North America. So if you're interested in finding out more about what LMDA does, check out lmda.org. Uh, we're here in Vancouver, which is a very special city here in Canada, not only for its stunning beauty, but also the strong connection between this area and its many First Nations people. I am honored to welcome Deborah Sparrow, who's here to welcome us on behalf of the Musqueam Nation. Deborah? I would like to take this opportunity to, to thank the, the host for um, doing the right thing in the protocol. And we know how important protocol is um, in the jobs that we do. And many times throughout the history of Vancouver, we have been not so obliging to remember what protocol is in our city. So we would really like to thank them for asking Musqueam um, First Nations to come and welcome you to our beautiful, beautiful and ceded territory. On behalf of my chief, Wayne Sparrow, my council members, and my community, but mostly on behalf as I always love to remind us, my ancestors, I would like to welcome you all here to uh, this uh, important discussions that you will have over the next few days. And uh, a lot of energy in the room as I felt you all move in tonight. And, <laughs> and it makes me stop and wonder myself, um, what other energies in this room? Uh, the energies we forget about. And maybe people in your positions don't forget about that when you're busy doing the important things that you do. As artists and creative people, that is something that we're responsible for. We're responsible for the histories and the stories we tell and how we act them out. And that's one thing that I've always honored about my people is that they have never forgotten who they are. They have never forgotten where they're going. My grandfather lived to be 100 years old and he had quite the sense of humor and he was a storyteller. And he used to drive me out throughout the city time and time again in the, you know, the last years of his life and show me where all the important places were. Not that every poor place is important, but just those landmarks that you know, I can still take drives on and show my children and my grandchildren as I do. And certainly people like yourselves in the future, if we can convince the city that there are other things to do in the city other than the ones that are today and that is to be inclusive with making some of those sites available to all people when they visit our great land, because that's why we visit a land. I'd like to welcome you from wherever you came from and know that one day we may come to your city and want to know more about you. And so those are things that are important, I think, when we are asked to come forward so that you know that this place is a very ancient land and today, we, this weekend, we celebrate Canada Day. I've always been too way about whether I celebrate or not, and mostly I don't, um, because I like to celebrate the 9,000 or 10,000 years I've been here. But uh, I guess we have Aboriginal Day, and um, it's a day of celebration for us as Aboriginals, but I've noticed that when we have most of our celebrations, it's ourselves there. So we're gonna welcome all of you and get the word out to when we have na National Aboriginal Day in the city, that it's for all of us to come and learn and be educated and share. And I think that's the important word. You know, someone mentioned to me tonight that much of your discussion will be about change. Wow. I want to share a really nice scene with you that I, I heard on PBS, <laughs> my favorite show. Um, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. 
So that's what's important. It's really not, you know, the way other people perceive us, but it's how we change the way we look at a situation or the bigger picture. So I always like to look at the bigger picture and as a weaver and an artist, I figure out how we come to the place on that large picture or that large textile. So with that said, I would like to again um, welcome all of you here to the Musqueam Territory. If you were, if a Squamish was standing here, they'd say a Squamish Territory. <laughs> and if a Slaytooth was standing here, they'd say Slaytooth Territory. So it happens to be Musqueam tonight, and we really do think, <laughs> we really do think and believe that this is our territory. So. Uh, Know, that's yet to be um, negotiated over our boundary situation. So, in the day there was no boundaries, you know. So now we, we are learning how to change that and how to change the way we look at things. So, with that said, again, I'd like to welcome all of you and hold my hands up to you on behalf of my ancestors and remember that yours are with you today, and, um, inspiring you. I oh, hope. Thank you. I and invite our hosts, uh, Derek and Pedro, up here. There's a few thank yous I want to, want to say. I want to start by thanking our local team who put this, uh, this whole thing together with LMDA and will be hosting us, making us feel welcome, making everything run smoothly for the next few days. Anyone who's um, run a conference knows that it's no small feat. And the volunteer hours uh, that these folks have put in represent a lot of time, imagination, energy, and faith. So I'd like to thank our conference chair, Heidi Taylor, and her team, yeah, let's give it up. <laughs> and her marvelous team, Rachel Deiter, who's here tonight, uh, Joanna Garfinkel, David Geary, Dee Dee Kugler, Martin Kinch, Giovanni C., Fanina Wobert de Cuiseau, and Richard Wolf, many of whom are in the room today. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> great young dramaturgs who are your conference staff. Uh, Anne-Sophie Woolnow, uh, Chantel Vogue, and Christina Andriola, and thank you to our videographer, Michael Sider. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, the conference uh, and this whole event wouldn't be possible without the very generous support of several organizations. Um, I would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, the City of Vancouver, Playwrights Theatre Centre, and Simon Fraser University School for Contemporary Arts and the Faculty of Communications, Art and Technology. Now, all of these organizations contributed funds and in the case of SFU, space for this conference. So I'd like to, us to take a moment to give them a round of applause. Pedro and Derek get up here to get us started. Uh, I'd like to invite Owen Underhill, who's the director for the School of Contemporary Arts, to welcome us on behalf of SFU. Owen, come on up. And uh, thank you very much for your support. Well, thank you. And uh, on behalf of Simon Fraser University, we're delighted that you came here to uh, Vancouver. And actually, it's the uh, second time that you've come to uh, Vancouver, because 11 years ago, uh, the LMDA conference was up at SFU on, on Burnaby. And now for three years we've been in this uh, new facility here. And uh, it's a, a real um, privilege to be in this uh, new building. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, becoming a neighbor in this uh, community and working together. We're doing a lot of community engagement. and. Uh, Working with a lot of a lot of groups, and uh, it's been really uh, very good for the school for the contemporary arts to be uh, moved downtown here. Uh, I would say that dramaturgy is an integral and fundamental part of the research profile of the school for the contemporary arts, especially thanks to uh, Dee Dee Kugler, who is one of my colleagues. <laughs> Disciplinary schools such as ours, dramaturgy is really a fundamental uh, connecting link, and it's also been uh, uh, a privilege to host some other workshops involving some of the members here, and we hope to do more of that 
uh, in the future. So uh, finally, I hope you have a uh, terrific uh, three, four days here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this evening's event. So thank you. Hello, <laughs> welcome to uh, LMDA's 2013 keynote event, Speaking of Change. We are your hosts tonight. This is Pedro Shivali. And this is Derek Chan. We are both alumni of the SFU theater program back when we were in Burnaby. Yeah. Uh, after graduating in 2010, we formed Rice and Beans Theater. He's the rice. He's the beans. <laughs> <laughs> And we've been writing, directing, and producing our own work ever since. Mm -hmm. um, well, our, how we came across dramaturgy was back in 2008, when we first took Dee Dee Coopler's dramaturgy class. Yeah, but I, I think, Derek, you could say it started earlier from the first time he assigned us a breakdown. <laughs> 2005. 2006. Yes, how many did you do? Oh, probably more than 20. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, yes. <laughs> Speaking of Change brings together five compelling leaders to share short, personal, true stories on a revelatory transformation or adaptation to change in their lives and work. But a major rev revelatory transformation for Derek and myself started way back in the day when the two of us left our homes. Hong Kong. And Chetland. Where? Uh, north. Yeah. Uh, we left our families and our friends behind and we dove headfirst into the world of theater. But enough about ourselves. Let me introduce you to our first speaker of the night, uh, Tara Bagan. Tara is a La Capa and Irish Canadian playwright. She is currently the artistic director at Native Earth Performing Arts in Toronto, where they are dedicated to the creating, developing, and producing a professional artistic expression of the Aboriginal experience in Canada. Uh, her debut play, Thy Neighbor's Wife, won a Dora in 2005, and she has since written 19 other works. Tara will be directing Dreary and Izzy at WCT, Gateway, Persephone, and SNTC. Next season, she'll be directing Native Earth's featured production of the much acclaimed Colchena, which she and the original creative team created. The work will deal in the community of Colchena, itself, touring, to, touring the West before returning to the Aki Studio Theatre and Rutes Panamericanas. Let's uh, welcome Tara. everyone involved with the LMD for this invitation. Uh, it's a real gift when you're asked to assemble your thoughts and present them to people. You have to comb through so many different threads and so many channels of thought and energy and hope and fears and love and dreams and kind of hone it down. And I always, I always feel very blessed when I'm kind of forced to do that. It's terrifying, but, it, but it's a real gift. Um, as our lovely host mentioned, I'm Le Kapmach. That nation is actually situated here in British Columbia in the interior. Um, the map behind you, though, of course, this is from a government site, so of course anything coming from the government, don't get with a grain of salt, but <laughs> and much as, as Deborah Sparrow mentioned, borders are, you know, they're sort of arbitrary. They need to be drawn now for, for various reasons, but so this is the outline. This is where we are. Um, you can't quite exactly see, well, they haven't outlined the place where my people are from. Does anybody know where Merritt is? It's yeah. Near Kamloops. So we're, I'm from Cold Water, so we're just south of Merritt. Uh, but really, then the Kapamach are from, we've ranged all the way down into, into Washington State. And of course, as many of you know, those of you who know anything about First Nations, a lot of the really, the larger, really strong nations, of which all of them are really, 
expand into what is now present-day uh, United States of America. That being no accident, in my opinion, because there's a it's a divisive methodology that um, keeps us from being quite as unified as we could be. Hopefully, that that continues to change the more we, our elders and our artists, question this idea of borders. Uh, the first time I came to Vancouver, I was like I was about 15. May have been a little bit younger than that, but I thought it was really, really beautiful. And I bought a postcard, and I told my dad I was going to live here when I was in my 20s. <laughs> Um, I'm out of my 20s, I have not yet lived here. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting thing to look back and say, what's my relationship to this city? What's my relationship to the downtown core? I certainly have uh, peers and colleagues who've written about East Hastings, uh, the whole downtown east side, uh, incredibly beautiful and heart-rending works that are situated there. One of the first shows that I saw Native Earth Performing Arts produce was directed by the beautiful, intelligent Yvette Nolan, who's like crouching down up there right now. <laughs> she directed Marie Clements' Unnatural and Accidental Women, and it was really a moving thing for me to see a British Columbian story right in downtown Toronto, where I still didn't really feel at home, and to feel a connection to those stories, and to see women from all these different nations in this piece. So, that's kind of sums up to how I got here, but my question becomes, how did I get here? So this is about change. I feel it's always important to look at where you've come from, where you thought you were going to go, and how you ended up where you ended up. I don't entirely know, but I'm going to take a few guesses at it right now. So here we are, beautiful Turtle Island, massive chunk of land, and somehow I'm thousands of kilometers from where my grandmother's lived, thousands of kilometers from where my mother was born, which I don't I mean, I can account for it in that I considered Toronto the theater center, and because Native Earth was there, that's where I went to, to practice, basically. Um, it was very fortunate for me that I did happen to arrive at Native Earth at a time when I was received with open arms, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the Nukapnuk are from Coldwater, as I mentioned. This is a little view of the village. It's quite small. I think there's the population fluctuates around 500. And we used to spend every summer there as kids. That was our summer holiday destination. And I didn't consider it at all unusual that I was spending summers on an Indian reserve. It's, you know, when you're a child, you think the world is only a certain way. So I assumed everyone went to a very similar place. Even Disneyland, I figured, well, it's probably very much like this. <laughs> I still don't know. I haven't, haven't gotten down there yet. Um, when I first learned about being an Indian, which is how my family talks about it, it was fascinating because it's like you've always been this thing that you've never really known to acknowledge and you don't know really where to situate it. But I do recall at the age of about nine starting to think about how it is actually different. This, this is not a normal thing. Not everybody goes to the reserve and hangs out with like big mass of cousins. And we all call each other cousin because somewhere down the line we're probably related, one would presume. Uh, when I was taught that I was an Indian, I said, well, what kind are we? And my mom, very often when I ask her about her own personal history, she sort of gets uncomfortable and often says, why would you want to know that? And initially, you know, not yet knowing about why she wouldn't want to tell me about it, um, it would upset me because I wanted to know where I'd come from. I would want to know what her childhood was like. I'd want to know what my great aunties had been through. So initially she told me, we're Thompson Indians. So then I realized, back home in Innisfil, Alberta, we had a mall called the David Thompson Center, and I'm like, hmm, could that be the same guy? It friggin' was. <laughs> so here's this river, and then a whole people is named after this explorer who discovered us. We all know the story from this, blah, blah, blah. So a uh, short while later, probably in my later teens, I was talking to uh, my cousin Sharon, who's a fantastic leader among the cold water people and asked her, like, hey, blah, 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 Thompson Indian. She was like, whoa, she kind of slowed me down there. And so she tried to teach me the word lakapamuk, which she might still kind of chuckle at if she heard me try to pronounce it. Uh, my tongue kind of stumbles on it because I didn't grow up hearing these sounds. So uh, how did we lose this history? Many of you know this already. But the reason my mom felt so defensive about imparting any knowledge to me is because it was taken from her right when she started to settle in. So my mom was kind of lucky in that she went to residential school when she was six. Her mom managed to somehow keep her home um, a little bit longer. I guess it's because she actually has an autumn birthday, so she started grade one at six. My mom was sent with her brother 
the story we all know, they were thrown on the back of a cattle truck and driven, uh, it's now about an hour away back then, like no Coquihalla, and it was a cattle truck, so it was probably more of a two hour drive. Uh, regardless, uh, my mom's family didn't have a motorized vehicles, so if the family got permission to visit the children, that would be about a three hour ride in a wagon. So the photo that you see here is the Kamloops Indian Residential School from about the era that my grandmother attended. I was going to dig into it and see how many generations attended there. I'm pretty sure it was at least four. I didn't want to ask because my family gets saturated with all of my questions. <laughs> so what is this thing, this saturation point? I've understood for a very long time, just from being on reserve, that as children and as learners, you don't, you don't ask, you don't pry, and you don't kind of like seek out the knowledge. When people are ready to impart it to you and when they believe that you're ready to receive it, it they offer it to you. But that's not how I've been going about things because it was just the process was too slow. Um, whenever I write something, I, I write it first when it's, when it's a play that arrives. I write it first and then I follow up with my family afterwards. So, one thing that I learned that, um, that's been important to me moving on from becoming a playwright through to really accepting that I always was one is the understanding that as a First Nations person, as an Akakamuk woman, arts are interwoven into everything that we do. So something like an LNDA conference, being invited, I was nervous as hell because I thought, oh, I just haven't read even half the things that everybody who will be listening will have read. Um, and people close to me said, you've been invited because you're to bring to the table who you are and what you are. So as I started to work through all of my thoughts, I started to think, okay, how can I focus my brain? Often when I write plays, I create a playlist. So one of the things that kept running through my head, it's a song that I've never really understood or ascribed any kind of meaning to, but it seemed to interweave with some of the things that I'm going to tell you about. I live in the hills you live in the valley and all that you know all these black birds you rise every morning wondering what in the world will the world bring today will it bring you joy oh will it take it away i asked my family this this artistic strain where does it come from this is a picture of uh, young women probably junior high school aged at the Kamloops indian residential school my mom is not in this picture it's of her era i'm pretty sure the woman uh, the girl down in the left hand corner with her eyes kind of blinking midway blinking is one of her best friends named leroy there happened to be five students named Pauline in my mom's grade when she was going to school, so they all ended up with these strange nicknames. My mom is Archie, this is Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> and these beautiful girls, uh, and a smiling nun, which you don't see too often. <laughs> uh, my mom, she's a dancer. Like she, she, when she does dishes and whatnot, she'll be dancing away and doing these sweet little things. Um, she joined this club because it was, some, it was a way of leaving the school. Uh, when she initially was taken to the school, there was two weeks off at Christmas. Shortly thereafter, they were allowed to return home for the summer as well. Uh, but this was an opportunity to travel around, to actually leave that environment, and as far as I know, to principally, principally be among uh, the female staff, which reduces um, the incidence of, of certain kinds of abuse, which is which a major plus. So my mom sort of found her way into art in a strange way. There's this great costume, of, uh, photo of my mom in a costume and it's labeled traditional Ukrainian dancers. <laughs> and it's all these, again, these beautiful girls dressed in this kind of, actually Disneyland-esque Ukrainian dance costumes. And it's actually in the museum at KRS now, in the basement. Um, I went there shortly after, it was turned into a museum. My mom drove me, wouldn't come in, wouldn't come in the doors. But I let her know that there was a photo of her in there, and she said, oh, why would they want to do that? <laughs> it's just like my mom. So, uh, might my mom have been an artist if she hadn't gone to KRS? Quite possibly. Uh, my grandmother is quite a beautiful craftsperson visual artist. This is her work here. 
The valley is dark, the burgeoning holding, the stillness obscured by the judging. You walk through the shadows, uncertain and surely hurting, deserted by the blackbirds and the staccato of the staff. And though you trust the light towards which you wend your way, sometimes it feels all that you wanted has been taken away. My mom was permitted to leave residential school when she was in grade 10. You were allowed to do that if you took on a trade. My mom went to nursing school. The first job that she took was back at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And if that's not a testament to the survivor spirit of, of my bloodlines, I don't know what is. But she decided to go there and she pledged to stay as long as it took to get every single child in front of a doctor. That meant the bus driver had to drive them all the way into Kamloops, which was always greatly annoying apparently for this bus driver that they called the Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye was notorious for spotting kids who were trying to run away, so he was not greatly popular with anybody, I can imagine. Uh, my mom met my father at Indian Residential School. He was head of boys junior rec admin. And they met at a Christmas party, and they were engaged two weeks later. So apparently they're, I also come from a romantic strain. Uh, my parents, like many people in the early 70s, moved to Alberta with, with the, the boom going on over there. There was a lot of employment. So there I was. I got born in Blackfoot country. We were taken often to powwows at the University of Lethbridge, very seldom outdoors, which is peculiar because if you've ever been to southern Alberta, the terrain is just breathtaking. So there I was in Blackfoot country. So I assumed when I was told I was an Indian that I was Blackfoot, but not the case. But much in the way that Tate Nolan often says that the blood will always tell, which I believe is how I've become a playwright, is I believe also that the soil will always tell. Growing up in that landscape under that sky and breathing that air and feeling that constant wind, I really believe it got into me. Uh, the very first play that I wrote that actually arrived to me, uh, almost whole, is set in Lethbridge. Uh, it's called Dreary and Izzy, and I, I dreamt it when I was in Toronto, and I was quite desperately homesick my first couple years there. And then when I endeavored to actually write the thing out, I was back in Lethbridge again. And I hit a wall at about page 40, and then I dreamt basically a moment that just made the rest of the play go. So in many ways, I believe that to those plays that arrive like that, they're a gift, and they're bigger than us. So it's a strange thing, you know, as a player, to try to push your work on anybody, because they're not really mine. They, they arrive through me, and I feel, I feel blessed for that. And I hope that I can do, do well by that. I love the best in you. You love the best in me. Though it's not always easy. Lovely, lonely. So Dream and Easy. This is the first play that Native Earth Performing Arts performed of mine. And as I said, it was fortuitous when I arrived at the company because it was being run by Yvette Nolan. And Yvette, much like me, is, oh, what is she called? Tomah Shamrock and Tomahawk. <laughs> so Irish and, and indigenous, basically. And Yvette, like me, was um, an actor and came through to storytelling as a playwright through that. And then has now become a very accomplished director. So my hope is that I'm, I'm headed on that trajectory too. And I've been very much supported by Native Earth in that way. Um, so there I was at Native Earth, identifying fairly newly as an Indian, and now identifying as a playwright. So probably the biggest change in my life, really. There are moments when I write these plays that arrive to me that I don't, I feel myself searching for a, a, an idea that I can't quite make out. I still feel like eventually I'll go back on some of my earlier plays and figure it out once I learn the language. Uh, I don't speak Lakatma. I have more Anishinaabe Mohan words than I do Lakatma because 
since I've been identifying and claiming and really walking in my own skin, I've been in Anishinaabe territory. So my hope is that I can fill out my artistry more and uh, move back to British Columbia eventually. So uh, things kind of conspired in such a way that I ended up being artistic director at Native Earth Performing Arts. Uh, we now have a theater. If anybody comes to Toronto in the next couple of years, please come and visit us. Uh, while Yvette was uh, artistic director, she established this very open door policy, just with the office and with our accessibility, and we're really working to maintain that. We're in Regent Park. When I first arrived at Native Earth, I was working as a playwright there and also as community liaison, and we were in the distillery district. Did, has anybody ever been there? It's kind of this dreadful place that, <laughs> and, as uh, sort of a hub for where the um, impoverished peoples of early Toronto or, or York really uh, worked in factories, distilleries, that sort of thing. Um, and then it kind of fell into disrepair for a very long time. And now I think there are about three different stores where you can buy a sweater for your dog. <laughs> and on, on any given day, you have to walk to work a different way because there's a film being shot somewhere because it looks so darn quaint. <laughs> so we moved to Regent Park, which is, you know, it's... To put it this way, uh, on any given day, you can walk through Regent Park and you will see some kind of a memorial for uh, somebody who's been unjustly shot. So. It's, it's a different kind of demographic. I'm gonna get into this more tomorrow when we speak about spaces and places, but um, it's been inherent in, I think, the journey, of, the journey of my change, taking on this building and having strange events like, like funders and ministers come through and being expected to talk to them because we're the indigenous kind of contingent of this big arts complex. It's an honor to be that, but it's also very strange to still be paraded out and to have to, you know, spend two minutes telling people why they're important, only to have them walk on and possibly never come see any of our work. So, uh, it has its positives, it has its negatives, indeed. A uh, beautiful thing about being in Regent Park is we're right near Council Fire, which is um, an Anishinaabe service organization. We're also near First Nations School of Toronto. It's probably about a 15 minute walk east. And we're also right near Anishinaabe Health, which is a health clinic that offers traditional and like regular medical stuff, healing things. Um, we're trying to figure out yet how to really connect with people who've been displaced from Regent Park. It's a massive gentrification plan that's been going on there. A lot of people were moved out, some were brought back, some of the housing was protected so that they could move in, could afford to live there. It's tricky to figure out how to, to honestly connect with the neighborhood. We are very excited about doing that, it's very much a full-time job. Uh, there's work to be done. The building that we're in, what sort of summed it up for me was the inaugural production in our theater, the Aki Studio Theater, was The Hours That Were Named by Keith Barker. This is a piece about uh, our missing and murdered women. At the same time, across the lobby, 51 Division, the nearest uh, police department, was having a fashion show. <laughs> so here we are having this thing about missing women who've been underserved by the system, and there they are doing some kind of a fashion show which is, it's just very deflating. So, it's, it's a trick, it's a challenge, but it's a good thing. Uh, in my 20s, when I was supposed to be living in Vancouver, I went to Montreal for the first time. When I was there, I bought a postcard and told myself I would live there in my 40s. <laughs> it's just around the corner. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of change to adapt to yet at Native Earth Performing Arts, and I'm very interested in, in surviving this period, which is very much a survival period. We took on the period at the end of a grant cycle, oh, I just put myself to sleep, at the end of a grant cycle where we didn't account for having a space. So budgetarily, it's been uh, quite the fancy dance we've had to do. Um, so I, I'm interested in staying there, seeing it through the change. I don't know when this will happen, but I feel like the more times I say it in public, the more likely I am to do it. <laughs> My goal ultimately is to return to British Columbia and to learn the Lakakmuk language. I can only do that living in merit, so that's gonna be really hard. <laughs> but I feel like, I feel in many ways, and I think all of us know this, but there are concepts that are lost to you if you don't have the language that 
that your ancestors do. I don't have the language even that my mother spoke for the first six years of her life. And yet I'm a storyteller, so, there's so there are holes, there are holes in me, there are holes in what I'm doing. And I feel like once I've, once I've served as artistic director for the time that feels right, I have to then serve my ancestors who've been offering me their stories by going and learning the language. There have been a few plays that have come through me that, as I've said, there have been holes in. Uh, this one play that I finished quite recently is called The Ministry of Grace. And it's, it centers around, it's inspired by the story of my granny, um, Mary Collins. She passed when I was five, so I don't know her very well. But there was a time when she had to go away from home because the grief, I believe, because the grief of having her children taken to the school was so great that she couldn't be around when she couldn't see them. So she responded to this call for labor in California and ended up down there working in cotton fields. And very shortly thereafter was recruited to a touring evangelical show. She was basically the tamed heathen. She'd come out and people would behold the wonders of Christianity and this Indian would read from the Bible and people would ooh and ah. Uh, from what I can gather, it was around that time that uh, this kind of letter that she sent to my mom at residential school didn't get opened anymore. My mom shared these letters with me probably about two years ago. And I think there's something in the fact that there are people outside of her own family who are interested in the stories from the land where she came from that enabled her to open these letters. I don't know if that's true or not. It's easier to say it to you than it is to her. But there's something about reading these letters with my mom and having her just receive them. She wasn't moved by it, it wasn't like a thing for her, but she read them and it enabled me to finish this play about her mom. And it enabled me to, to finish the script with the words of the character inspired by her mom saying, I'm coming home. We will walk. We will walk. We will walk in good company. The shepherd of bright and flowing. You see. of the Toft Lake Center at Norm's Fish Camp, uh, a creative retreat in Minnesota. Uh, she has served as the resident dramaturg at Mixed Blood Theater, uh, as the literary director of the MacArthur Theater, the director of the new play development at Act Theater in Seattle, Washington, uh, the literary manager dramaturg at Seattle's Inman Theater, and as assistant literary manager at Actors Theater of Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she has served as the president and board chair and is a current board member of LMDA. And as well, she serves on the advisory board of the NNPN and is a member of the new project group of ITI. Uh, please everyone welcome Liz Engelman. <laughs> joke, the one dramaturg joke. <laughs> There's so many dramaturg jokes. How many dramaturgs does it take to screw in a light bulb? 
The answer, of course, being, does it have to be a light bulb? <laughs> That's kind of how I felt after I was honored to be asked to be one of the keynote speakers for Speaking of Change, my inner dramaturg voice piped up and I thought, does it have to be change? <laughs> Do I have to speak? Because um, I'm humbled to speak in front of all of you because you are all experts in change. At a cellular level right now, your bodies are in fact changing as I'm talking to you. And if you really want to go there biologically, which we do, uh, every seven years, if it's true that our cells regenerate completely every seven years, then the Liz that is standing up here talking to you right now is a Liz three times removed and hopefully three times improved from the Liz who attended her first dramaturgy conference 21 years ago. So I've already changed and you're, you're still changing. The only, I mean, change happens, change is, the only real change would be if there was no change. And that's actually a keynote that I would like to go to, adapting to no change, because <laughs> I see change, I court change. And if you look over my first chapter, I guess, of my dramaturgy career when I worked in at the institutional theater, for the 10 years I worked in institutional theater, as you've heard from that bio, um, I, held, I, I worked at four different regional theaters in that span of time. And if you do the math on that, which I'm not really good at, but it comes out to something like a little bit less than a three-year itch at each job. And if you look closer at that pattern, I guess what you'd find, if you're interested, uh, was it kind of goes in a cycle. It would be new and interesting for me at the beginning, and I'd watch, and I'd learn, and I'd observe, and then I'd have an idea, and I'd want to try it, and seed it, and watch it grow, and so there'd be a new festival, or a reading series, or, and then that became settled in the new norm, and as soon as that became the new norm, the itch started, and I was ready for the cycle to begin again. So, I guess I thought, unexamined in a way, when I was growing up as a young dramaturglet in the mid-90s, that the way to be a dramaturg or literary manager meant working in a regional theater. And I seemed to have a kind of unassumed or maybe assumed ladder, career path that you would take. From an intern to an assistant literary manager or dramaturg to running your own department to maybe going on to a big, bigger theater, larger sized theater somewhere else. And a few years into this, climb, uh, I looked out and I was kind of on a top rung of that ladder, it, or maybe it wasn't a ladder, it was more like a step stool or a footstool or something, it was either I had gotten there really quickly or it was just a really small ladder. Uh, and there, there wasn't another title I was looking for, there wasn't a bigger theater that meant better. Um, if there were only, any rungs left, those rungs just represented change. And it was that cycle again of something new, something fresh something to seed and something to plant, something that said older than it was time to do it again. So there's a question I ask myself, and it's not a joke, because there's only one dramaturg joke, which I've already shared with you. So the question I, I ask myself is, what is a dramaturg not in relationship? I guess the joke answer would be single, which yes, it's true, I am. But it's a deeper question for me. A dramaturg is always, almost always, in relationship or conversation with something or someone play and its meaning, a playwright and her vision, a director and his interpretation, an artistic director and her agenda, a theater and its mission, an audience and their experience, a marketing department and their deadline. <laughs> um, but what is a dramaturg really in relationship to self? So if you cared and looked at the next chapter of my life as a dramaturg, um, when I stepped off the institutional theater ladder and branched out into freelance dramaturgy and served as president of LMDA, I guess I was interested in looking at what was it like when a dramaturg acted out of an expression of their own idea or passion and curiosity. So when I was president, one of the conferences that we put together was Dramaturg as Generator, which is pretty self-explanatory, I guess, and I uh, established the Dr Dramaturg Driven Grant. It was important to me that the dramaturg could be the first one in the room with an idea rather than the last one uh, at the table in the rehearsal room. And I instigated the early career grant for dramaturgs to come to conferences, not only to be able to help financially your being here, but also to see what it was like at an early stage in your career to be able to articulate what it was that you wanted from an experience and what you thought you as a dramaturg could bring to that experience. But I realized I hadn't actually turned that on myself. And I presume we all 
value the role and function of dramaturgy, we wouldn't be here right now. And if you don't and you're here, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I don't think I really truly understood the deep impact that dramaturg could have until somebody turned to me. And that's what I was, I was leaving my term as president of LMDA and I was wondering what could I do next that was an expression of my interest and vision and curiosity and not just in relationship to an invitation as a freelancer. And a playwright friend of mine said, you should talk to a friend of mine who's a life coach. Do you know what that is? I thought, oh yeah, life coach. They're like drama tricks for people. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to this wonderful life coach named Sandy, who indeed was a dramaturg for me, and I told her I had a career question. And she said to me, write down the six times that you've been blissfully happy in your career. Not just had a really good time doing that, or I was really proud of that, but blissfully happy. And like a true dramaturg, she reflected back to me what the patterns were, what the connecting threads were, what the motivating principles were behind those different experiences. And she also asked me to notice what, if there were any surprises on the list. So I did the exercise, like a good student, and what she said back to me were these six words. She said, community, conversation, creativity, innovation, sun, and water. <laughs> and I thought, bingo, because I was interested in starting an artist retreat in the summer on a lake in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> surprises were on the list that she had asked me to, and there was a big surprise on that list, which was, of all the blissfully happy experiences, there was only one that took place in the regional theater rehearsal room. But, and that was at Florida stage, sun, water. <laughs> uh, but if you had asked me in the 10 years that I was a dramaturg at those four places with my three-year itch, if you had asked me, do you love what you do, are you having a good, good time, I'd say, yes, I love my job, I love what I'm doing. I'm, but if I look closer at the pattern, I realized that I was not blissfully happy in the Abbey. I was much more happy climbing that tree um, and talking to playwrights on the beach at the O'Neill or in the sun at the Area Playwrights Festival or ASK Theater Projects when it was still around. Seven years later, I spent the summers on a lake in Minnesota <laughs> uh, at an artist retreat called Dolphin Lake Center at Norm's Fish Camp. I spent the other eight months of the year at Hedgebrook, which is a retreat for women writers. I spend a lot of time around trees. I'm surrounded by them all the time, and I am so inspired by trees. Their roots are so deep, their trunks are so strong, their branches reach up, lift to the sun, they're beautiful. And I look at all the weather patterns that they endure in a day, or in a week, or in a month, or a year. The windstorms, the thunderstorms, lightning, thunder, calm, and then temperatures below freezing, 40 below, 90 degrees. And those trees don't resist the change. They, they withstand change. They stand with change. And their trunks and their branches are a living testament to their dance with change. And I thought, even though I've transplanted and uprooted many times in different soils, and I haven't found a soil that is called my permanent home yet, I realized that I'm not just Maria climbing a tree, I'm a, I'm a tree too, and my roots are deep and they're in community, conversation, creativity, sun, and water. And my trunk is strong. It's, as a dramaturg, it's curious, it's questioning, it's visioning, it's seeding, it's planting. And my limbs, my branches are, have been many, intern, assistant literary manager, literary manager, dramaturg, director for new play development, literary director, freelance dramaturg, you know, I think you heard the, the bio, but all those branches, for me, lift towards sunlight, which for me is joy. And at an open conference, an LMDA conference in Banff several years ago, I wrote the words joy on a wall, tapped into the wall, and put about three chairs out on a patio and hope someone might join me. And at the, at the conference wrap-up, the wonderful Harriet Power, she noticed in the, the feedback session, she noticed with surprise how many people came to the session on joy and how nobody spoke about joy in relationship to their job or their work. And that made me really sad. Because for me, joy is the sunlight that nourishes and fuels the leaves on the branches, and joy is the rain that nourishes my roots. And without joy, those 
limbs would fall, my core would be hollow, my roots would be brittle, and I would fall. So I just urge you all from my place in the woods on that island in that lake to find your joy, dig deep, uncover your roots, embrace your trunk, dance with, tr with change, and be the most magnificent tree you can be. Thank you. He is the co-founder of the PUSH Festival, an international multidisciplinary festival where he has been the executive director since 2005. He has worked on the commission, creation, production, and presentation of both devised work and new writing for the stage, contemporary and classical adaptations, site-specific endeavors, large-scale interdisciplinary events, dance, theater collaborations, and live remote radio broadcasts. He has also consulted on not-for-profit organizational development, overseen integrated outreach programs, and spearheaded public forums on innovation in the performing arts. Next year, besides his work on the PUSH Festival, he will also be directing the world premiere of Pauline, a chamber opera based on the life of Canadian poet Pauline Johnson scored by Tolkien Stokes and written by Margaret Atwood at City Opera, Vancouver. Please welcome Norman Att. Norman Arman. Um, uh, I don't know why I'm here, actually. Um, <laughs> Uh, I used to like to joke that I would never go to a cast party at a show I wasn't in, but um, actually uh, being invited into a conference of an of a organization you're, you're not a member of is kind of amazing. It's sort of like being in the locker room of this kick-ass football team or, or baseball team that's on the, you know, the 11th uh, uh, win in a row and such. So it's a real honor to be asked to be here. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, I could talk to some degree, um, you know, when speaking over the phone with Heidi about the question around change, and it seems to be in the air a lot. I was at a conference today uh, about uh, leadership, a uh, one-day conference just around, around the corner down the street, and it was about change as well and, and such, and was asking about how people deal with organizational change and how you get board members on, on side and staff on side and this and that. And I was talking a bit about the PUSH Festival and the beginnings of that and how it was a bit of a fraud situation for me to be up there on a panel talking about it because we didn't have to deal with change. We were starting from scratch. We were starting from the beginning and that was quite simple in some ways because we could just start from the beginning and kind of crazy and stupid and really hard because you're starting from the beginning. And that was, uh, I guess, uh, 10 years ago. This, this year is our 10th anniversary. And we started with a very simple idea, Katrina Dunn and myself from Touchdown Theatre, around trying to create a change in this community, a different situation, a different context um, uh, for which we were going to create a work, for which we were going to challenge each other, challenge ourselves, challenge the media, the funders, the, um, the, the public at large, and to try and create, create a different situation in which we were making work. And also, too, because we were in Vancouver, we were also wanting to create new connections elsewhere, uh, this sort of rain curtain. And it's thick. It really is, man, it's thick. And it's not so much about distance, it's about, I guess, geography and terrain and history and other things, but um, it is a big distance and a big uh, thing to try and connect this city to other places. So that was a big part of what we were trying to do. We had both come from SFU, so we had big ideas, big notions. People like Owen were my teachers, uh, was one, uh, we were teachers of mine and Katrina's. Um, and we had big notions around what art could be in, in a contemporary society and how it was situated in history and relationship to other practices, certainly in the arts, but also other questions around economics and social justice and other things. So we wanted certainly to kind of make that change over time. Um, and we went from a very simple, tiny little idea called a series and a name called Push that, uh, that uh, Lainey Slater came up with, uh, who's a marketing 
brilliant whiz in town and works with the film festival now. And we started with this tiny, tiny, tiny little notion, and it grew over over time, very, very slowly, from a three shows, William Yang from uh, Australia, an extraordinary photographer, storyteller, uh, One Yellow Rabbit with a, a show called um, Dream Machine, um, and then um, Marie Broussard, a remarkable artist from, uh, from Montreal who works a lot with Robert Lepage, but has her own career in her own right and such. So it was three shows, and nine years later, last year, we had uh, 20 shows in the main program, a three-week uh, club called Club Push, uh, co-produced with Theatre Conspiracy and co-curated with Veda Hilly and Tim Carlson. Um, we had, I guess, 34,000 people come, which was uh, up from 24,000 people the year before. Uh, we had, I guess, over a million media impressions bought and earned and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we've really kind of, in a lot of ways, come a long way, but I still find myself asking right now about the future, and I think next year, this 10th anniversary, and we're going to open at the Vancouver Playhouse with a gala performance one night only of a company from Berlin. And the Playhouse, of course, has a hugely loaded emotional question about life after the Playhouse Theatre Company is dead, unfortunately, the demise of it. Um, but I still come, I find myself sort of coming back to around and that change in time and other things, they loop a lot, you know. I mean, I don't think you're ever the same person, whether it's three years or seven years or ten years. But I do think that things loop around a lot. Um, earlier today, I went for a film audition. Now, I haven't done film for since 2005. I stopped it. It's a ridiculous thing to try and do while you're trying to build an organization. Um, but I, I got an email from my agent, sort of my agent, although he's not my agent really. He took over the, <laughs> well, he took over the company from somebody who was my agent, but, and um, saying that this casting director was begging me to come in, and it was sort of a strange experience because it's like begging me to come in, but like, well, not really, really, <laughs> selling me that. Um, and I went out to, um, and it was a Tim Burton film, so that's kind of okay. So now I'm kind of stuck sucking up to this idea. <laughs> and I rush out at, from this panel and I go to this place and I, you know, I come in the hallway and there's various people, you know, a, a certain type, but, you know, similar of the same type, sitting beside each other. And um, this woman asks me and takes my photo and everything and then asks me for my, my talent sheet. And I look at her like, I don't know what she's talking about, talent sheet, what, what are you talking about? She says the piece of paper, oh, right, right, that thing that you're supposed to fill out and everything. And then I went into the room eventually and she's thinking on some Yahoo, of course, I'm sure. Why is this guy kind of being auditioned for this part? And here's Kareem Mears. And Kareem Mears is an extraordinary casting director. She's a remarkable person, and she is an extraordinary casting director with a huge amount of influence and her track record is remarkable. And she gets up out of the couch and walks across to me and hugs me. I mean, what the hell is this? You know, it's like film, right? This is brutal stuff, five minutes in and out. And we're talking for at least five minutes about Italy and this and that and various things. Because we actually have a friendship. We, we actually like each other. And through the years, this person has given me probably 70% of my television and film work. And when I was running Rumble Productions way a while back, that actually sustained me, you know, uh, sustained me through a lot, a lot of things. And she sustained me. She gave me work that I never even actually auditioned for. She'd just call up and say, look, you've got the part, come on in and do it. And one time she did a film on her own and she asked me to come in and, and do it, uh, to act in it, and I did. Because uh, she meant something to me know, beyond the business of things. And we talk about theater as something that's about people, and I still absolutely believe it's about people. Um, theater for me is not about stories. I understand that idea of stories and this and that. I, my partner is a visual artist. She can't stand the idea of my stories, my story, my story. <laughs> uh, and she's, she's Métis, so she doesn't have an issue with history and all that. But the, the notion around theater is people's obsession with the idea of story. With, for me, theater is about events. I was always interested as a director as the idea of events. This notion or point in a piece, on a stage, in a room where things froze, where things led up to something and you held your breath because you were scared of what was going to happen or what was going to happen afterwards. This idea of theater as being, for me, a witness to the blow of experience. I had a director once here at SFU. Uh, who talk, talk to me about that idea, the idea of a blow of experience, and that as an actor, or as a director, or as a writer, or as a creator on the stage, that you were trying to kind of give some kind of space for that idea. And to me, the notion around theater also is this idea of the cost of things. 
that this theater is the stage, it's the laboratory to imagine and create some fictionalized representation of another idea, another place, another person, or even yourself, me right here now, pretending to be me, but to speak about the cost of things and to conjure that up in some way as a kind of visceral body thing that you could sense, you could smell, you could hear, you could imagine. So two years ago, as you may know, some of you may know, I had an event in my life. Um, I was running the festival at the time, it was the middle of the festival, it was 2012. In the middle of the festival on a Saturday night at Club Push, at intermission, I had a heart attack. I had a full cardiac arrest. I was on the floor for five and a half minutes being given um, CPR. Um, there's actually somebody here, uh, Christina is here actually, she was working Club Push that night. Um, and that event for me was a kind of a rude awakening of a, uh, in a way. I'd been a heavy, heavy smoker. I'd smoked for many years. I'd actually given up the year before, so in kind of true sort of Irish Scottish thing, I was not fucking going to get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> the artist that night was um, Mary Margaret O'Hare. Mary Margaret O'Hare was remarkable. She never played Vancouver. We weren't really responsible for getting out. It was actually Peggy Lee, who uh, was an extraordinary cellist, one of the best in the world. And she had struck up a, this friendship with Mary Margaret O'Hare and they coaxed her to come up. And she's a very fragile person, uh, remarkable human being, but also a very, very particular and fragile person. And it coaxed her out to come up and play with various musicians locally. And this group toured around. I mean, it went up to Bowen Island and other places. They were getting concerts, 40 people, from Mary Margaret O'Hara in their living room. I mean, it was kind of remarkable. Well, they decided after the heart attack and after being whisked away, and Richard Wolf is here, he was there that night as well, that, um, that they would continue to play the set. Um, it just seemed right, perhaps, I suppose. And the song that was on the set, the, the next song um, to be played was, that if you know Mary Margaret O'Hara, kind of one of her signature pieces, it's Body in Trouble. <laughs> so they played that. The fact of the matter, though, for me, is, is that there I was in the room with colleagues. I was there with friends. I was there with my workmates. I was there for, with my soulmates. I was there with the people that I actually really cared about, that I really spent all my time with, that I had actually, in many ways, dedicated my life to. And the person who actually saved my life is a man, and there were a number of people around me who were saving my life, but the person who actually did the CPR on me was a, was a close friend of mine uh, who actually works at this institution. His name is Michael Boucher. Um, he's somebody that night who asked if it was possible that he and his wife could sit beside me and my partner, Lorna, if I wanted a drink. I asked for two uh, Prantinis which he took sort of some umbrage with, but he got them for me. <laughs> but he was actually sitting there with me when I went down, when I collapsed uh, at the time of intermission. What I didn't know at the time that he was a paramedic. He had actually been one in, the, in his 20s in Montreal, with a lot of pride, and a really good one, and had been really good at CPR, and knew how to kind of kick it in the first time, and how to do it for, well, in my case, five and a half minutes, until the, they came and they did the two you know, bumpers. Um, and that worked for a little while until we got by the arts club and they had to stop and do it again. I'm not sure what that had to do with <laughs> This is the, the note that I sent out a week. Well, it actually wasn't a week later because stupidly I actually went back to the theater a week later. Um, I was just sort of determined to get back on the bicycle and not to go a year without being there in the middle of the festival. And I heard a man, Taylor Mack, I don't know if you know him, out of New York, a remarkable artist. And he was doing a song, uh, an evening that ended with him doing a a cappella version of uh, Heroes by David Bowie. So I heard that that night. But this is what I wrote and I posted on a Facebook. I wrote, Thank you, everyone, for your thoughts, notes, flowers, and other acts of love and kindness. Rather than reach out to all of you individually, I wanted to give you an update and fill you in. Please, no need to respond to this. Basically, I'm good. I'm at home with my loving wife, and she, she hit me for calling her my wife, Lorna. As my GP said the other day, I'm a lot safer now than I was last Friday, the night before the medical incident. In fact, there is only a 10% chance of what, hap of what happened 
reoccurring, which is much better odds than those I had for surviving what befell me, i.e. the very same 10%. I had a heart attack, a full cardiac arrest. My cardiac specialist at BGH uses the word insult, as in the insult to my heart and body. Who said words can never hurt you? In a nutshell, I had a blood clot form in a major artery very close to my heart. My heart seats up and began acting irregular with no real beat. I had collapsed unconscious in the intermission between the acts of Mary Margaret O'Hara and Peggy Lee and Club Bush in performance works on Grand Island. A group of individuals, some I know personally, some I don't, then proceeded to save my life. I was given CPR for over five and a half minutes. The paramedics, upon my arrival, put the paddles to me. My heart restarted. I was taken to an ambulance by VGH, to, by, to VGH, Vancouver General Hospital. And along the way, I required the defibrillator again. Truth is, they stopped the ambulance directly in front of the arts club. Not sure that there is any meaning to <laughs> tell these stories again. Whether unconscious or not, I can't remember any of this. All was recounted to me. At Vancouver General Hospital, I was given an angioplasty with a stent angioplasty, also known as percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, is a procedure that uses a flexible plastic ca catheter with a balloon at the end of it to dilate narrowed arteries in the heart. The procedure usually includes the placement of a metal stent to hold the artery open. In this way, angioplasty helps to restore blood flow to the heart muscle. A stent is a small mesh tube that is used in treatment of coronary artery blockages. This was done within an hour of my arrival for the record, I have actually good and free-flowing veins, normally, and my blood pressure is also very healthy. I also stopped smoking a year ago. I was medicated and put in ICU. That's where the really nice people are, the nurses that are, that is, and anyone who has or does encounter the BC health system hopefully knows that what I'm talking about. I'm astounded at how empathetic the care was, how tender and endearing they are with the wounded such as me. There were lots of friends, many who accompanied me to the, the trip to VGH. Thank you. Not sure that Lorna would have gotten there when she did or that she could have weathered as she did. Thank you. On Sunday, the push board of directors and staff, under the leadership of Max Wyman and Minna Schendlinger, who is the festival uh, man managing director, held an emergency meeting, divvying up my duties, strategizing communications, and the like. Could there be any greater proof of the festival's resilience than the sheer speed, calm, and professionalism with which board and staff responded? There's succession for you. In fact, a succession strategy was put in place this year for the festival. But in the end, no amount of planning and forethought makes up for the human quotient. And here, too, I feel remarkably blessed. I love the people I work with, and I mean both board and staff. They are my friends, my colleagues, my soulmates. As a good working friend and true Welsh manner once quipped, I won't work with anyone I wouldn't wish to have a drink with. There were 35 people around the table on Sunday. I was released from BGH Tuesday at noon. I'm home and recovering. I've been cleared to return to my desk jockey job, as my cardiologist referred to it. But I'll do the mature thing and take the next few weeks off. Long-term effects, not necessarily horrific or debilitating, though I may now be driving a six-cylinder, I think it's seven actually, rather than an eight-cylinder I may have once possessed. Only time will tell. I have, no two, I have two other such brushes with mortality. Those have had similar events and will confirm that it can be an overwhelming experience, to tears, perhaps. I could have been a thousand other places doing a thousand other things. There might not have been a single soul around me at that very moment. And I'd like to think that the most human beings, the most human beings gain comfort, that most human beings gain comfort from the thought that their lives are adding up to something, that they are in fact meaningful, valued, and of consequence. Thank you all. If I had any childish doubts, there they are no longer. Fortune? Fortunate dance of jade like Walter Houston in the treasure of Sierra Madre. Mm -hmm. Do you know where uh, Walter Houston learned that jig, that dance? He learned it from Eugene O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Make that next time you see it. Um, on behalf of Lord and myself, Andrew, I feel truly blessed, blessed. I look forward to seeing you sometime soon in this lifetime. So, what's changed? This is just a quick list. I drive a size seven cylinder rather than eight. I eat better, I eat more regularly, uh, I eat breakfast most of the time. Uh, I drink less, or I mix that up a little bit. <laughs> Two glasses of wine and a cocktail. <laughs> I do exercise more, I make less of things I might have made of before. Listen, I listen, listen, humor, listen. I don't shy away from disagreement, I honor it. I realize more and more that it's never as good as you wish, nor as bad as you fear. 
I have a genuine interest in the well-being of the people who are around me. It's as important, if not more important, than the work being done. And done, I steal this from the woman who wrote the book, uh, Lean In, um, Facebook uh, CEO. Yeah, uh, done is better than perfect. <laughs> like that one. Um, it's only friggin' theater. <laughs> um, and lastly, it's hold tight the people who you know. Hold them close. Forget that enemy thing. Hold close the people that you know and love. And stay curious about those who you don't know. Because you never know where in the future something may bring you together for some meaningful and consequential event. There is a picture that I have actually on my desk that somebody in the office framed or something. And it's a picture of me and Michael Boucher downstairs in the theater in the week before uh, after an opening. And there's a guy, Fred Lee, in town. He's a big, um, he does uh, like a gossip column and stuff like that. He's pretty wild and wacky character, but he loves to take pictures and everything of opening nights and stuff. Well, it had been a bit of a rough sort of opening, and I felt guilty, actually, frankly, because I hadn't given Michael any space to talk off the top, and he's a very important partner, and I said he was a huge and really important partner to the festival. And there was this moment where Fred Lee grabbed me, and he said, Norman, Norman, I want to get a picture of you. I want to get a picture of you. So I could have just gone, well, I'll get a picture of me. And I saw about five or ten feet away was Michael, and I went, oh, Michael, come here, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I grabbed him, and I brought him over to, to be together with him for this picture. And there's this picture of the two of us the week before, smiling as if we cared about each other, as if we needed each other, as if we actually loved each other, which we did. Don't forget, you never know when you might meet that person. <laughs>
so I just began to feel more and more hollow about it. I began to feel more and more like I didn't understand what the work was for. And I always want to be really careful here to say that, I, that I'm really proud of the fact that the company has continued on and has continued to do really excellent work. But for me, that kind of process of, of killing yourself to put on a show that runs for four weeks that 600 people see and, and you know maybe half of them are other theater artists, like I just, I just didn't know what it was about. I, I couldn't draw any kind of line between that work and the sort of change that I really wanted to be a part of making in the world. Um, so, I, so I walked away from it. And there I had, you know, I was the artistic director and I had a salary and the work was growing and I just, I just didn't understand it anymore. So I, I often think about that sort of like a, like a very difficult breakup. Uh, not because there is bad feeling between me and the company, but because it was hard to walk away from that kind of family and that kind of experience. And, and it left me kind of like not wanting to date for a while. Um, <laughs> And, and I had to really, really uh, go through a kind of crisis of faith in, in the theater, and in, in kind of what I wanted to do next. I, during this time, I wrote an article that apparently a lot of people have read called Please Don't Start a Theater Company, um, <laughs> in which I gave people the advice to not, not, not just not start a theater company, but, but don't start a theater company and fail to examine the kind of inherent disaster of the way we structure theater companies. Um, so, I, you know, I really didn't know if I was going to stay in this field, and I found myself on the way to a TCG conference that was that year in Los Angeles, and I was in the, the gate at the Oakland airport, and it was a Southwest flight, so you know, you don't have assigned seats, and, and in the gate I ran into my friend Susie Falk, who's the managing director at the California Shakespeare Theater, or Cal Shakes as we call it, and uh, as so we started talking in the gate, because it was Southwest, we ended up sitting next to each other all, all the way to LA, and she's telling me about this grant that they got from the Mellon Foundation, thank you to the Mellon Foundation for all their work and all their support of so much change, and, and she's excited but frustrated because they've gotten this big grant, and it's a grant to set up a partnership between the California Shakespeare Theater and Intersection for the Arts, which is a, a multidisciplinary organization in San Francisco that, that does work focused on arts and social justice. And all they really know is that they're supposed to work together now. And they've had this money and they're sort of in like month eight of the three year grant and like nothing has really happened yet. And Susie's kind of worried that they're like maybe gonna have to give the money back and they, they just don't know what to do. Like there's vision, but there's no action. And so you don't know we're on the plane. So I'm like, well, I don't know, do you want some advice? And, you know, this is what I would do if I were you. And um, this becomes one of these kind of serendipitous life moments where I sure enough then several days later get a call, can I please come to a meeting at Intersection? And I find myself being offered the job of coming on board and figuring out what to do with this money and, and what to do with this like sort of arranged marriage that they don't quite know what to make of it. And I think, well, okay, <laughs> you know. And so here I am almost two years later and I'm uh, the director of what we now call the Triangle Lab, which is a joint program shared between those two organizations. And it's a, it's a program that's dedicated to bringing artists and communities together to try to make change. Um, so this has been a, a really interesting kind of arc for me. Um, as we look at, at what it means to make a lab. We call it a lab because we're trying to experiment with how things might change. And it's a triangle because we're looking at, at the role theaters can play in bringing artists and communities together. Um, I like to often quote the brilliant Diane Ragsdale who, who often says, uh, does it really take 200 administrators to put on a play? And um, I know I think we all kind of basically know that the answer to that is no. Um, but where I think the role of those theaters with sizable staffs, where it really does take all those people and all that time, is if we really look at deeply connecting our work to the community we live in. Um, so what I wanted to share with you today is a little bit more in detail of the story of how you try to change a theater. Um, Cal Shakes, for those of you that, that may or may not be familiar with it, is uh, a mid-size, which in the Bay Area is like around a $4 million theater that does a summer season of outdoor theater. Uh, time was, that was mostly Shakespeare. They've expanded after that into Shaw. And, uh, uh, but more recently, and I shouldn't make fun of them because they do wonderful, wonderful work. And, and, and more recently, they, they uh, have begun to do new plays and have begun to really commit to this idea of, of, of what role they can play in, in, in their community. And, and so what, you know, charged with this, how do you begin to move a theater from producing plays in the subscription season 
to, to really this vision that, that they've articulated of wanting to, to be part of making positive change in their community and be a, a valued and kind of essential part of their community. So I can skip to the end and tell you like it's really hard and we've barely started and we're we're nowhere yet. But um, but but I can share also some 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 things we've discovered along the way of the sort of beginning of this journey that we've been on. And uh, I, I like to talk a lot at, at my work about the rubber band. And I say you know making change is like kind of stretching out a rubber band. And the minute you let go, it just snaps. It snaps back. And so we say it. At, at the theater, we say, oh, that was one of those rubber bands snapping back moments, right? That was one of those moments where you, you let go or you stop paying attention, and it's so easy to fall back into the way we always have done things. Um, and you know, you do, do what you do, you get what you got. And um, uh, so, you know, when I, when I really started to try to articulate, and, and I, I, get to, I think I have this conversation a lot, you know, what, what are the necessary elements for change? And I think, I think it's pretty clear that you need vision um, and at Cal Shakes and at Intersection, we kind of have that in spades. We've got Jonathan Moscone, our artistic director, and Deborah Cullen, and the executive director of Intersection, two incredibly visionary people. Sometimes it's too much vision. Sometimes I see the staff just thinking, God, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and so we have this vision. And then I, what's become clearer to me over this time working there is that you need also what I would call a disruptive influence. And so there's this kind of incredible insight here of bringing Intersection into the work as a kind of permanent, kind of resident disruptive influence. So you, you've got these kind of this staff, this organization with completely different kind of size, mission, values, who just are continually kind of asking these questions from the very small to the very large that, that really continue to shake up business as usual. I think you also need resources for, for real change to happen. And, and we've, been, we've been lucky enough to, to have those and continue to attract those resources. But even with all that in place, you know, what do you do? What does day one of change making at the institution, you know, really look like? Uh, luckily enough, I was I was reading uh, on that same plane ride. Actually, really, I swear, um, this book called Switch by the Heath brothers. Some of you might have read it. It's a book about making change stick. It's kind of written for businesses, but it's a really interesting book. And and one of the things they talk about in that book is they talk about creating a destination postcard. So kind of writing your your idea of, of where you if you set yourself a postcard from the future you know what, how would it describe your your vision and so we, we began to articulate this kind of shared vision around more people participating in theater making in more different ways so really bringing more people to the table really changing who we thought of as a maker who we thought of as an artist whose voice was in the room and were we even in a room, or were we on the street, or were we in the neighborhood, or were we outside, or were we in a bar? You know, where else could we be making theater, and how else could we be making theater, and who else could we be inviting to, to make it with us? So kind of with that as our destination postcard, we began to figure out how to, how to move forward. And, and then right away, I realized that what you need next is you need allies. And so I kind of looked around the, the theater, and it's a mid-sized theater. It's not one of these 200 people theaters. There's like maybe 25 people that work there. but, but um, some of them are more kind of fired up about this than others. And so I, I, I very carefully kind of put together, really, it was like a cabal. I don't know what I, I remember what I called it, but it was, it was like a cabal. I had one person from the marketing department, not by any means the marketing director, and I, I had one person from the education department and, and, and one person from the production staff. And I sort of found somebody who was an ally in each, in each department. And for the first year, that group of us met every week to try to figure out how this change worked in all the places in the organization. And then I was very happy I got to retire my cabal because it had, it had like spread more through the organization. So, so that, was, that was exciting. Um, and the next thing we realized is that we better start making some work right away because we've been talking and talking and talking and you know people would understand what we were talking about and then a, a, like half an hour later I'd be like, what is the Triangle Lab exactly? Um, what are you talking about? You know, and I would say, well, that sounds like really like good grant language, you know, and um, it was working there. But, you know, it wasn't, wasn't really coming across another way. So, so uh, Cal Shakes was doing a uh, production of Spunk, uh, which is George C. Wolfe's adaptation of some Zora Neale Hurston stories, and we thought, like, okay, let's let's do a really deep example of what we mean, and let's do a really broad example of what we mean. So we created this this residency. Uh, up till now, Cal Shakes's residencies were really pretty much like we're going to come into your high school and we're going to do ten weeks on the Tempest, and at the end of the time, then some kid, kid, the kids are gonna do monologues from the Tempest, and this is great, this is awesome work, but it didn't really match with what we were talking about, which is really about how everybody has a story, everybody's got something to say of their own, and so we, we said, well, okay, so Zora Neale Hurston was really like an anthropologist, and, 
an anthropologist of her people's stories. And so what if we asked kids to, to really be anthropologists of their own community? So we created a residency curriculum where kids in this middle school in Oakland did photography and interviews and, and created pieces based on um, kind of people in their own families and their own communities. And then we, we did a display of that work kind of up at the at Cal Shanks' space. So that was a that was a kind of our example of kind of going deep. And then I thought, well, you know, how do we sort of convey to this audience what it means to be part of the of, of the making, to really be expressing your creative voice? We thought, well, you know what, let's have a dance party on the stage after the show. And you know, like I was really skeptical about this and I hired this choreographer and I said, look, it might be like 10 people, so I don't know. It's kind of an elderly audience, it's outside, it's, it's like really cold after the show is over. And you know, that show was so great and it was so exciting, there was so much dancing in the show and there was so much kind of call and response in the show that they were ready. And so we had these dance parties that were like 150 people kind of crammed on the stage. We had to hire extra stage management staff to like stand at the edges of the stage so people wouldn't fall off. And so this is our example right away of like, what does it mean if everybody gets to dance? And so now I started saying, you know, every show should start with a potluck and end with everybody dancing on stage. And like, that's what we mean by a participatory culture in our, in our theater. And, and because we had done that dance party and like the funder put a picture of it on their website, it was all exciting. Um, you know, we were able to really, people knew what we meant by that. Um, so that was great. And then the next thing we said is, look, you know, we got to give this over to the artists. One of the things we, we want to do right away is just bring a lot more artists to the table. You know, in your regional theater, there's like so much kind of curatorial screening. Like, I don't know, have you directed at any other regional theaters? And like, did you go to Yale? And I don't know. Has this play been produced anywhere else? And I was like, you know what? No, no, we need to, we need to make a space that doesn't feel like that. Um, that feels like we're sharing not just the work, but sharing the curation as well. And so we created this project called the Artist Investigator Project, because uh, we're a lab, but we like to kind of play with that metaphor. And so what, what would happen, we wondered, if we, if we asked artists to tell us what they wanted to experiment with. So we put out this very kind of general call, and we said, what do you think the performance of the future might look like? And we're going to give you $4,000 in one year and you have to posit what experiment you would do. So we got 140 submissions. And some of them were like from Poland and from all over the place. And uh, so we ended up commissioning 10 artists uh, to do experiments, either in kind of where you might do work or in how you might work with communities differently. And, and, and so these are all kind of in process right now. And I'll just tell you about two of them really quickly. Um, one that I, that's about to kind of launch next week is uh, called Full Balcony. This is a video artist named David Slaza who's uh, doing a crowdsourced video version of the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. So he put out a call online. To, you could film yourself doing either Romeo's lines or Juliet's lines from the balcony scene. And then he's cutting them together. So he'll have this, this sort of five minute video of several hundred people from everywhere doing the balcony scene. And then we're, we're playing it on video monitors uh, on your way in to Cal Shakes' production of Romeo and Juliet. So we're gonna have the, the professional balcony scene and then the crowdsourced balcony scene. We're just kind of really interested to see like what that means, what, what how that works. So more, I'll report back on that. And then we're working with another, another artist named Ariel Brown who's uh, working with mothers in Oakland who've lost a child to violence. And she's been working with them. Her project is called Love Balm for My Spirit Child. And she's worked to collect kind of testimony from these mothers and then they are performing the pieces at the site of the homicide. So looking at kind of theater of witness and looking at how witnessing can, can change space. Um, so those are just two examples of what happened when we asked artists what they thought they might be interested in, in exploring. So um, after that, after we found some allies, did some examples right away and then gave it over to the artists, what we started seeing next was um, a little like, unexpected to me, but now I understand it. What we saw next was fear like that actually like change had started and then people started to freak out and i thought that i thought that was kind of good it kind of meant that we were getting somewhere because fear was starting to surface so that's the next thing that i kind of learned was like okay now we have to make a space for people to be afraid and we have to let them be afraid and then we have to respond so we had a staff meeting where we were just like brainstorming about well you know partly like, try to have a participatory culture like at the theater as well and um uh, people were brainstorming about sort of our next set of activities, and this one staff member just burst into tears. And I, and I was, you know, I had to stop. And I said, you know, what, what's happening? And she said, you know, you keep saying everybody's an artist, and you know, I'm an artist. I don't even know if you know I'm an artist because I'm a, I'm a box office manager, and I don't get to be an artist here. And she was, she was just crying, and and we had to really stop and ask ourselves, like, well, how do we make room for the creative voices in the organization? 
what does that mean to do that here and not just saying like, well, the community members are artists too, but here, actually, could you please finish that brochure? Um, <laughs> so that was a really telling moment for me and really something that, we, that we're trying to think about and try to, you know, try to figure out. Um, and then recently, we just closed a production of Richard Matoya's American Night, uh, which is a really extraordinary kind of look at, at uh, 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 the history of America. And um, we commissioned uh, a visual artist to create, uh, the, the Triangle Lab is, is also interested really in bringing artists of other disciplines in kind of in collision with, with theater. And so we commissioned a visual artist to create an installation that would be along this sort of winding path that you, you walk on to get to the outdoor amphitheater. And uh, so we chose somebody who was like, you know, provocative and satirical. This is going to be like, this is Richard Matoya of Culture Clash. So we wanted it to kind of like go with the play. And so she creates a, 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 an installation of uh, carnival signs, the history of American immigration told through carnival signs. And so they are, we, we see the draft of them and they are of course, you know, provocative, satirical, difficult, and scare everybody. And so we have this sort of emergency staff meeting about it. And people start line editing them. They start being like, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that joke and I'm not sure and you know and so uh, we begin to have this like kind of awful committee process and I'm kind of trying to imagine my like pretty much a dramaturgical meeting with this poor artist where I'm gonna have to be like sign three is a little bit not clear to us you know so so <laughs> I finally just say you know look here are the two choices we can use them or not use them um, we invited an artist in we invited in another voice yes or no, I think no is fine. We say, look, we're not ready. We're not ready. The fear really was like the play was already really, really, really a stretch for the theater. And like, do we really want people to like walk up the path and be like pissed off already? Um, so we, so, and, and then this is something that I have to say, like I honor so much the man that I work for, John Moscone, because he was in the middle of directing the play, which is for all of you that direct is always a really kind of terrifying moment, that kind of like week before tech where everything's a disaster. And he said, look, I can't be brave about anything else this week. You decide. You decide. But he said, when Richard Montoya hates them, it's going to be on you. So I was like, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. So I said, OK, I love them. I love them. Let's do them. I said, OK, all right, all right. Remember what I said. So we put up the signs. And uh, uh, Richard doesn't come into the first preview. He comes to the second preview, and I'm not there. And I get a text from him. And he says, can you give me the name of the artist? Because I want to buy these signs you know, after the run of the show. <laughs> so I was pretty excited about that, and it was really a, just a great kind of moment of saying, like, trust the art. Trust the art. And they, they ended up being a really kind of important part of the, of the project for us. Um, so I think um, the other thing that we're discovering, too, is that as you go forward and you get through this fear and you get through this, is you start finding these, like, weird fossils. Like, so a lot is changing in the theater. And then there are these things that are, like, left over from how we used to do things. So I have this strange inherited program that we call the Community Access Performances, which already you can tell that's, like... <laughs> so that's a program where we give free tickets away to community groups. Um, so we have a mess, very problematic, we're working on that. But, uh, so, uh, we're working on this for the last show. And, you know, we realized, like, God, the marketing department, here's how this program got invented. There were tickets that they couldn't sell. So they thought, like, what should we do with this excess inventory? Let's see if there are any community groups who would like these free tickets. So then you find yourself in these terrible phone calls with, like, this community group that you have no relationship with, that you're trying to make a relationship with, that you decided it's really important for your theater to have a relationship with, and you're like, how's Tuesday night? How's the second preview? How about July 4th? You know? So we begin to go back to the marketing part, and we say, well, like, how come we can't offer community groups tickets on Saturday nights? How come we can't offer them tickets to the nights that, you know, like, people want to come to? <laughs> and, and the marketing department says, but what about, you know, what about our, our ticket sale goal? Those are the dynamically priced nights. You know, those are the nights where, like, we have to make our money. And, you know, I'm not saying this because the marketing department is the devil. In fact, the marketing department is on our side here because they are the ones who really understand what it means to increase participation in our art form. And so we actually had this great staff meeting where we said, oh, this used to be a program in the marketing department and it's still constructed like a program in the marketing department. What would it mean if we took this program and we brought it over here? And then the development director said, oh, well, why don't I just try to raise money to cover the cost of these tickets and then they don't have to be aligned in the marketing department's budget. And it was like, oh. So we like discover these fossils, and then we unpack them, and it's like, oh, right, it doesn't, it doesn't have to go there. So that's kind of a little bit about what 
some of the tactics are, the, the, the change-making tactics and, and how it's going. I think the other thing that's really useful that I just want to close with is, is uh, so in the Bay Area, we have, of course, our, our tech industry neighbors, and we, we hear a lot about the, the cycle of how innovation happens in those companies, and, and, and so we hear this, this described a lot. Uh, if you're not from the Bay Area, you probably can't recite this along with me, but, but uh, so you prototype something, and you, and you bring it to market, you get consumer feedback, and then you bring it back, and you iterate. And so we talk a lot in the Bay Area about, sorry for my jargon, my tech jargon, but it's really important because I think they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing about the cycle of change. They know what they're doing to not try once and then be done or be like, okay, we had a strategic planning process that lasted nine months, and then we set our plan, you know, we set our vision, we've rewritten our mission, and then we're done. You know, what we're trying to do in the lab is to really look at how you can iterate change, how you can try something, see what works, learn from what didn't work, and try again. Um, and I think this is a really big question that we're asking, that I think a lot of us are asking all through the, the field. You know, how can theaters, how can our institutions actually be a part of making positive change in our communities? How can we become more essential to the people that we live among and the people that we're serving? How can we actually be nonprofits who have a mission that is about serving the public benefit? How can we really make that good? because I think we're beginning to understand more and more that the production of plays sold for very high ticket prices that still don't cover our very high overhead, like that just doesn't answer that question for me anymore. And I think there are lots and lots of us for whom that just isn't the answer anymore. And so how can we really answer that question? I don't know. Can theater make change? I guess the only way I'm gonna figure that out is to try, and to try in small ways, ways that we can allow to fail, ways that aren't about like, Oh my God, we went fifty thousand dollars under our budget, or whatever. You know, but we can have small experiments led by artists that we can allow to iterate, and we can see what change looks like when we try it again and again. So thank you very much for letting me talk to you about change. And Carmen is a Vancouver-based theater artist who has worked extensively across North and South America. She has written and co-written 20 plays, including Chili Con Carne, Trigger, The Refugee Hotel, and Blue Box. She is currently working on two new plays, The Trial of Tina Madotti and Anywhere But Here. Her work has been nominated for a Dora Award, for Jesse Awards, and the Siminovich Prize. Her memoirs, Something Fierce, Memoirs of a Revolutionary Daughter, is a number one national bestseller and won CBC Canada Reads 2012. She's currently starting her work on her second book, Mexican Hooker Number One, to be published by Random House. She is the recipient of the 2002, 2002 New Play Center's Best New Play Award, the 2011 Union of BC Performers, Lorena Gale Woman of Distinction Award, and Langara College's 2012 Outstanding Alumni Award. Carmen has over 60 film, TV, and stage acting credits, is a theater of the oppressed workshop facilitator, instructs in the acting department of Vancouver Film School, and has directed a dozen plays. She's a graduate of the theater training program Studio 58, Langara College. Please welcome Carmen Gale. be like fucking exhausted by this point, so I, I, I'm just gonna dive right in. When I was 18 years old, I had the most searing theatrical experience of my life. It happened in Lima, Peru, during the Civil War there. It was May 1986, when I had just joined the Chilean resistance that was fighting Pinochet's right-wing dictatorship. Now, if you joined the underground outside of Chile, like I did, you did so in Lima, where you would get your orders. But first, you had to take the oath. 
The oath said that I would give my life to the resistance, that I agreed to be executed by the resistance if I broke under torture and gave my comrades away, and that I would always follow orders no matter what. Security was of the utmost importance. People fell all the time. Pinochet's dictatorship was considered one of the most secure in the world. In other words, the secret police were everywhere. And the Peruvian secret police worked with Pinochet as well. So one must never, ever do anything stupid. Stupid things included, but were not limited to going to the theater. <laughs> it was okay to go to a mainstream performance of, say, Mary Poppins, because the probability of the secret police going to Mary Poppins to look for dissidents was quite low. <laughs> but to attend a performance that could have been considered in any way alternative was absolutely strictly prohibited. The cops, the military, the secret police were more likely to show up at an alternative performance and sniff around for possible subversives. And if you happen to be there, and if they happen to discover who you were, you'd be dead if you were lucky. Most likely you'd be tortured to the point of no return. The day after I took the oath, while I was walking around downtown Lima, sobbing uncontrollably under my mirrored sunglasses due to being gripped by a state of chronic grief and terror, my first husband, who had also joined the resistance, pointed out a scribbled sign on a telephone pole. In between my heaving and sobbing, I managed to read the scribbled haphazard sign. It was advertising a play. The play was to start after curfew, which was in and of itself illegal and hence beyond alternative. And the scribbled note said, come if you dare. So being young and very stupid, my first husband and I broke all the rules of the oath we'd taken a mere 24 hours earlier, and we dared to go to the play. We arrived just before curfew at the allotted location. There were a couple of dozen other people there of all ages and mixed social classes. We all nodded at each other and then stared at the ground as Lima prepared for curfew. Last stragglers running home, packed buses speeding down the street, the first military helicopters. I sobbed quietly, the terror never subsiding until a First Nations man in bare feet and white pants came out and gestured to enter the building, which looked like a school of sorts. We followed him in single file with a mix of excitement and doom because no one knew whether this was some kind of setup and we were all heading to our tragic, basically self-inflicted deaths, or whether it really was a play. <laughs> We were taken to a classroom where the chairs had been arranged in a circle. We all sat down and the man disappeared. As time passed, the sounds of curfew became more prominent. Now, curfew was mostly just silence, except for the intermittent sounds of helicopters, military vehicles, a bomb exploding here and there, and the odd shot ringing through the night. These sounds became our walk-in music, as it were. We all grew even more terrified, that was obvious, chiding ourselves that we'd all been stupid enough to take on the dare. I wondered if there were secret police members in the audience. A fresh stream of tears gushed from my eyes mercilessly, unrevolutionarily. All of a sudden, a guitar played and a man came in, a troubadour of sorts, also in bare feet and white pants. He sang a beautiful song with no lyrics, just haunting sounds. He was followed by a woman, bare feet, white attire, and two other men dressed the same, the last one being the man who'd let us in. For the next two nonstop hours, these four performers told us the history of Peru from the time of the Spanish conquest until that very moment in time. May 1986, the Civil War. 
They told the story with their bodies. No text was spoken. Sounds emitted from their mouths, but not a single word. They created image upon image upon image and a soundscape with their voices and breath, periodically punctuated by the sounds of curfew. The images were of genocide, rape, slavery, starvation, and ultimately resistance, a celebration of life. The history of that country from the point of view of the oppressed slash freedom fighters. They finished their play by dancing a cumbia as they sang the only text, we may be fucked, but we're fucking happy. <laughs> More tears flowed. For the rest of the night, we all stayed in that classroom, chatting, sleeping, laughing, until curfew was lifted at six in the morning. That play and the circumstances in which I saw it is seared in my brain to this day. In that moment in which for all intents and purposes I was having a nervous breakdown, I was willing to break all the rules and risk it all to have a story told to me and it paid off. The play gave me the inspiration to continue, contextualized once more why I had chosen to join a movement that sought to liberate my continent from the very oppression depicted in the play. And it gave me joy in a great time of terror, in a, in a time of great terror. It expanded my tiny universe of paranoia and let in the light. Basically, it took me out of myself and reminded me to not take myself so seriously, that ultimately the story was much larger than my own personal narrative, that I had put myself in a terrifying situation, that I had risked it all in order to serve a larger story in which I was a mere player, and that that was worth doing. By the time I came back to Canada to go to theater school in order to learn the skills to tell the stories of my community, the Latino community in exile, stories that are rarely, if ever, seen on Canadian stages, I thought I knew everything there was to know about risk and terror and failure, because the revolution we had been fighting for had been lost. Innocently, arrogantly, I thought that I would not have to experience risk, terror, and failure again. <laughs> because I thought that the artist artistry behind good storytelling was about pretending convincingly. I had yet to learn that a well-told story is most effective when there is no pretension at all. That a story moves us to the core when the storyteller unmasks herself and seeks the truth in every moment. And that truth seeking is by its very nature risk taking. And that risk taking often leads to failure. And that all of this can be terrifying. And so when I remembered those Lima curfew players, it dawned on me that the risk they took was twofold, yes, they were taking a political risk by performing their play after curfew to an audience that may have included the enemy. But they were also taking an emotional risk by opening their hearts to a bunch of strangers that may have included the enemy. This dual responsibility was so great that letting us down was not an option. They contextualized their story personally, socially, politically, and historically and thus reminded us that we mattered, that our communities mattered. And in sharing a piece of art that was engaging in content and form, they made themselves vulnerable emotionally and artistically. There was no pretending. They told their truth, they risked failure. As the military seized the night, they risked it all by being present in every moment, by opening their hearts and minds. And that is why we transformed from a paranoid audience of individual stories into a courageous community with a larger story in common. I had risked it all to hear a story, and the reason the risk paid off was because those highly skilled storytellers were able to articulate my own defining story, 
conjuring meaning out of raw experience. They took us into the dark and transcended the pain. They created symbols that the entire room owned, reminding us that our stories matter. They let us know they were committed in every sense of the word to social and artistic transformation. That was a key point in my learning, the redefinition of risk. And so now, whenever I tell a story, if I'm not afraid on some level, I know I must be doing something wrong. I learned to risk vulnerability after developing a hard, necessary shell under Pinochet's Chile. I learned that the terror of risking vulnerability in front of strangers in order to seek the truth in every moment was equal to the terror I felt in the resistance. I learned that many times when we are telling a story on the stage, we fail, we get it wrong. I learned that the definition of a successful artist is simply someone who insists on doing their work in spite of or because of the risk, the terror, the failure, the public humiliation. Pablo Milanes, the internationally renowned Cuban singer-songwriter, has said that he pities the artist who does not risk himself or his art. When I started to learn the art of storytelling, I was able to see exactly what he meant. Those curfew players put themselves on the line in every sense of the word. I strive to do the same, and to this day, nothing moves me more than a piece of art that risks it all. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our evening here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our wonderful speakers for sharing their stories and their moments with us. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts here at SFU, uh, the LMDA, Deborah uh, Sparrow from the Musqueam Nation, and uh, all of our lovely volunteers who've put this together and helped me get run smoothly, and all the ones that will come through here this weekend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we would also like to thank Heidi Taylor for giving us this opportunity to. Um, well, we wish you all a good time during the rest of this conference. And if you would like to watch the speakers again, uh, check out the How Sound website or the LMDA website. Uh, How Round. How Round. Sorry. Uh, ah. Also, uh, hope we'll see you at the conference bar which is the Poor House on 162 Water Street in Gastown. Just ask him over still know where it is. Um, <laughs> well, that's all for tonight. Drink up and have a good night.
Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Chloe, yeah. you better yeah. give Chloe a ride. Chloe, you did a beautiful Chloe. job, guys. Really. Right out um, there. I'm not we were staying in Burnaby. We needed to get Sky Train down there. Oh, yes. I could do that. So, so we can walk up the building on Main Street. What's tomorrow? Friday. Friday. Let me ask somebody who knows. Okay. But, but don't. Let's. Right out No.
here. Well, I, I like to do it. Just stand this. Then, as other roommates, watch this like. You guys go like this. No, 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 no. Oh my, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we work. That's how we work. That's 